he came, but I was very didn't really know what he was doing. I know he talked to a lot of the people and was kind of asking uh, what was happening with the different people who were down there. But I don't know what kind of work or follow-up he might have done with that. Did he... Did he... he you've already done that for several weeks. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, he came down uh, somewhere, I think, in the middle of the summer. I'm not sure. I don't remember the dates exactly, but I think we had been there for several weeks. And, um, do, you, do you know where he, where he stayed? Did you all stay yeah. together? Or uh, no, the, um, the civil rights workers stayed in different people's houses. We paid $10 a week for room and board. Uh, the house I was in, three of us stayed there, and we shared one big double bed, and um, uh, usually took our meals out, but occasionally had meals in. Um, so he, I'm not sure if the medical committee had set up places for people to stay, uh, but uh, we stayed at home, so there were no motels or hotels. And what some of those places cost then? Well, what was what, it like? Well, it was a small county seat back then. Um, it had a downtown area with some shopping and um, the courthouse. And that was a white area, and we pretty much stayed away from that. And then it had a uh, black area uh, where a number of the streets were not paved, um, and people lived in small houses, although I think a number of people owned houses. And then cotton fields came right up to the edge of the city, and there were people who lived in shacks in the, on the edges of the cotton fields. Did um, John go to Clarksdale because you were there? I don't know. I, I suspect that might be uh, the case because my father could have helped arrange through Aaron Henry um, the uh, uh, place to stay or a visit, but I don't know what his offices were. Did you know that there is a biography that came out about a year ago of Aaron Henry? No, no, um, I, let me see if I can yeah. find it. I can't yeah. this. Yeah. Aaron Henry, was he the, um, the organizer in Mississippi? He was, he, got, right, he was the head of the NAACP in Mississippi and was the person chosen to run uh, the, for the uh, campaigns that the Freedom Democratic Party ran. He for governor and... Uh, for the Mississippi Freedom Belt uh, Party's uh, attempt to get seated at the Democratic Convention, he was one of the two delegates. And he was the, in the 1950s, he began organizing at the time, and very few people were doing that. And he would, had a statewide reputation, but he was not an official part of the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or their group. They were kind of in a coalition together called COFO. Um, I don't know what COFO stands for, but, uh, uh, and Aaron Henry was one of the heads of that. I don't know that that book will, I doubt it, I, you can look in the index, I doubt it will have Dr. Thompson in there. Did you, um, okay, so he was the key part, he, he was in Fox. Yeah, he was, he, he oh, was a pharmacist and he owned a, uh, a drugstore in Clarksdale, and as such, he was uh, um, in a good a economic position in that he was supported. You know, his customers were mostly from the black neighborhoods, so he wasn't easily threatened by whites. Well, as you can see from that book, um, he had, you know, quite a lot of brave things that he did in the course of his life. I mean, did you encounter, um, I mean, violence from the police and harassment? The, uh, there were several incidents in Clarksdale. Um, the uh, time uh, that was the most threatening was in Marks, Mississippi, which is a little town outside of Clarksdale. And, um, saw a couple of cars of the civil rights workers went out there to register voters and they were surrounded by uh, groups of whites and threatened. Uh, the police 
at first didn't do anything, but in the end there was no actual violence. And then what the uh, Student Unbound Coordinating Committee does in that situation is we then immediately, uh, myself and a couple of other people, went out to Mars to stay. And the theory in that was always that the lesson of them trying to intimidate us was that we would just be back so that there wouldn't be a feeling that uh, you know, was uh, successful in scaring people out. And um, that was around, that may have happened while Dr. Thompson was down there. I can't remember, but I, I think I have some vague memory of that overlapping with this day. And um, I think you know about it. Do you remember roughly how long it stayed? I don't know. We were down there um, overall somewhere like six or eight weeks, I guess maybe eight or ten weeks. Uh, we went down there early June and um, I think the end of August was going to be And I, I think he was down a few weeks, but like I said, I don't really, I don't know much. I'm just curious, how how is it you decided or got involved in trying to write about it? Okay. Um, it's because after the Second World War, he realized, as he was a scientific intelligence officer, that what he was investigating was actually criminal. And he um, had the eye, he called um, the evidence which he was looking at uh, medical war crimes. Mm -hmm. And with that, he contacted um, war crimes um, investigation units. And the scientists said, look, you know, we should be working together. And he did this with the, um, the US, the British, and the French. And this was in uh, November 1945. Mm -hmm. And the evidence which was then collected formed the basis for the Nuremberg Medical Trial. Mm -hmm. From the, that was six months later, he, collect, he really had collected an enormous amount of evidence of mm -hmm. uh, scientific atrocities. Then um, the interest, the significance of the normal medical trial is that at the end there was a judicial pronouncement of informed consent. Mm -hmm. And um, Thompson was on the sidelines throughout the trial. So that's mm -hmm. the key sort of point right. at which, because my work is on uh, German medicine and Nazi medicine and this sort of thing. And that's where I encountered him, mm -hmm. just from the point of view of archival research. Right. And then you found out more about where you were doing here? Um, then it was really, I, um, after uh, writing about the Nuremberg Medical Trial, um, I, the question is really, um, why was it that he responded in such a deceptive and sensitive way to the um, why, why him? And um, what was the then, how did his, uh, he um, cared for a lot of Holocaust survivors, mm -hmm. how did that change his mm -hmm. medicine, the sort of medicine which he was um, um, practicing? That. So, right. it's really, so the study then takes on the broad significance. So mm -hmm. That's the key issue. Now, obviously, this is at the end of his life that uh, Thompson, the, I mean, I, the, I mean, Thompson um, made a comparison of the, um, the Nazi Holocaust with the, um, and the injustice in Nazi Germany with um, what was going on in the South. Mm -hmm. He drew a very, very direct comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know whether you, I mean, was that something which you came across? But we, we didn't really, um, we didn't really think that way, I think. It just, it didn't occur to people to put it in a historical context because we were just really doing the, the front line work. The medical committee itself was really pretty separate in terms of it, it had its own goals. I don't really know a lot of what they did. This, the uh, 
uh, student groups, we were divided into two programs, registering voters and um, teaching in what were called freedom schools. And um, uh, those, I think there, were, there was kind of an immediacy to the voter registration, which is what I did. You know, we were just in a, essentially a political campaign. We registered people. Um, they weren't allowed to register officially, so we registered them in our own forms and uh, submitted thousands of registrations to the Democratic Party at their convention and um, demanded that the regular Mississippi Democratic Party be excluded because it, it um, didn't support registering black people. And um, that was in violation of the Democratic Party's principles, some rules they had. And um, the, uh, this book goes into it in some detail. Uh, the offshot of it was that um, Lyndon Johnson was running for re-election. Um, Kennedy had been shot and Johnson had been president for a year. And he did not want, he was running on post. Uh, he was the sitting president. And he did not want any uh, issues that were troubling in the convention. He wanted the convention to be uh, positive, upbeat, support him and the unified party and so forth. So he told Hubert Humphrey, who was um, a very liberal senator uh, and had a long history of civil rights supporting civil rights, that Humphrey, who had wanted to be the vice president because he wanted to run for president himself four years later, that Humphrey could have the vice presidency if he could satisfactorily resolve the um, uh, dispute between the Freedom Democratic Party and the regular Democratic Party in Mississippi so that there was no hassles at the convention. And so Humphrey was very close with a lot of the labor, established labor unions that had supported civil rights, the liberal labor unions. And um, they put a lot of pressure on the Freedom Democratic Party to uh, compromise. And the compromise was that both groups would be seated and the Freedom Democratic Party would have two voting delegates, Aaron Henry and a woman named Fanny Hamer. Um, and this caused a deep split in the Freedom Democratic Party and the student groups. The students didn't want to compromise, and the older hands, such as Aaron Henry, did, and eventually they did compromise. And uh, so there was a lot of political intensity happening uh, that summer, and I don't think people were thinking about comparisons to World War II or any, you know, they were just out there working hard. Um, and the, the advantage, I think, of the voter registration was, even though people weren't actually registered to vote, it got people's interest up. It was very, uh, I can't remember how many thousands of people signed up, black people signed up. It gave us a chance to talk to them. And they, um, that activism carried over and, you know, eventually you have uh, uh, majority voting in after the Civil Rights Act in 1965 um, in many of Mississippi counties in Clarksville, Coahoma County, the county was one of them, had literally a majority of black voters. All these white, racist uh, sheriffs now suddenly had to run and ask for the black people's vote and had quite a dramatic impact. And uh, that act was passed to, right after 64. The next year, Linda Johnson introduced the Voting Rights Act. And it, uh, of all the civil rights legislation, it probably had the greatest impact. Because like I said, suddenly, you have a state, the state of Mississippi you probably had half the counties had um, uh, majority blacks. So school boards, sheriffs, uh, County boards of supervisors, all of these people, black people got elected, and all these people had to get black votes. So, uh, did you applaud the down to Mississippi? No, he was in New York the whole summer. And I think I, um, 
know Jim Lady now. He spent a lot of time going traveling to Washington, D.C. with um, Carolyn Goodman. She was the mother of Andy Goodman, one of the three civil rights workers who was killed. And there was a lot of, when their bodies were missing, um, there was a lot of pressure being put on Lyndon Johnson and the United States government to investigate, to use the FBI to get involved. And um, my dad got involved in that, so they went down to talk to the people in Washington, D.C. a number of times. So you, you, Andy Goodman? Yes, he was, uh, he and I lived in the same building, and we went down to the train um, uh, session in Ohio together, we drove out together, and then we were split up, he went to Philadelphia and I was in Boston. So, uh, yes, we were very involved in uh, Cali, and my parents were friendly, and um, that whole summer they were just constantly writing and uh, uh, pressuring Washington, D.C. and doing what they could. My dad also, he, another thing that he did do, and this is something that, I don't know if Jim Thompson was involved in or not, but my dad, um, are several people from the South, black civil rights workers, as they got burned out, would come we go out of the state to get away from the pressure. And my dad was one place. They stayed in our house, and he essentially did therapy, not long term, but to, you know, kind of talk to people about crises they were having, usually just the intensity of the summer. So he did that and um, kind of a rest and rehabilitation. And I, I would imagine there was probably a network of people doing that and it might have been through the medical committee on human rights, I just don't know. But I know my dad uh, did that and we had, um, we became friendly with uh, Emma Moses, um, Bob Moses was the head of the civil rights group and his wife Emma came up and stayed in our house uh, and got to be uh, friendly with us. And there were some other people as well. You live where in New York? In New York. In New York, Manhattan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you know how John Thompson decided to go down? Do you know the history of that at all? Um, not really. Um, just before we've only been involved in an organization called Catholic Burger Movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he goes down twice. Um, he goes down in December again. Mm -hmm. And then I think he's and he he then writes. Oh, I've been in I've, I've been in prison and I've been beaten by the police. Mm -hmm. um, there's also. I mean, he wrote to friends or something. He has there's a letter from. Yes, he wrote to the unadopted son. Mm -hmm. And he writes it. He, he, he writes it to his son. Um, there's also something which I saw on the um, another internet source. Um, John Thompson, your father um, picks him up from the airport, and uh, he says, "Well, at one stage they were under uh, fire from the police, mm -hmm. and once they were." crouching down, there was, a there was a student next to him, and the student turned to him and he said, Dr. Thompson, have you ever read any John Donne? Mm -hmm. That's great. And John Thompson thought this was one. You don't know the story. No, I hadn't heard that. Right. Well, there was, um, there was violence in Clarksdale before we got there. Uh, homes were sh shot into from the NAACP leaders. Uh, Aaron Henry's house being one of them. And um, during the summer, there was no uh, direct violence. There were some threats, but no actual violence in Clarksdale. I told you about Marks, Mississippi. We had a, a, um, an encounter in um, uh, the county north of us, which is called Tunica County. And um, 
is the county that um, and it has, and as of 1964, it was the county in Mississippi with the highest percentage of black residents, with almost 80 percent, and it was the poorest county in America, and um, for obvious reasons. And uh, we went up to Tunica to try to register people, and on the way back, we were followed by um, a car, which we thought was a police car, though it was unmarked, but we thought people had uniforms. And um, I set up to get away, um, and uh, they, they followed us to the county line, and I set up as we got near to Clarksdale, and they um, uh, set up and pulled us over. So we, we pulled over, and it was very interesting. Uh, there was no, unlike what happened in the Goodman, there was no violence, but they were convinced. They searched our car. We had there were five of us in the car while I was driving my car. And um, uh, we had been registered, and we had a priest who was one of the people who had come down through some Catholic group. Um, the police were convinced we had guns in the car. All the propaganda that the papers had printed about this is an armed invasion of Mississippi, these were the sheriffs in the county actually believed it. They could not believe we, we did not have uh, rifles or uh, guns in the car. Anyway, they arrested me on speeding and took me to the uh, courthouse, but I was released on bail, $20 or something like that, and um, uh, agreed to pay a traffic fine, and that was the end of it. Yeah, so, <laughs> it was quite, uh, yeah, that was, that was, I mean, that was a very, I mean, that was a hard thing. I mean, were you aware of this medical committee of human rights? Or was there just so few of this committee? Mm -hmm. of I, you know, I had heard of them. Yeah. There were a lot of groups that were in this coalition, mm -hmm. um, and other groups, labor unions, now, the Catholic Workers Movement, I don't remember hearing, but there were different groups that came down or sent people or were involved in some way. And I didn't really pay much attention. I was involved with the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and that was the group that I was aware of. And they were the main group uh, in the coalition. And um, uh, the black people in our office were in Clarksdale were SNCC workers. Um, there were two of them, and uh, the Bob Moses, James Horn, all the main leaders of the, that summer were Stoke and Carmichael were um, uh, in the SNCC portion of the movement. And I think SNCC was considered um, the more radical of the group. Um, as I say, like in the convention in the summer, Aaron Henry, who was in the NAACP, wanted to accept the compromise, and the SNCC group didn't want to accept any compromise and wanted to have a debate on the floor and so on. So I think probably throughout the summer there were politics that I was not aware of um, among the groups deciding tactics, and part of that may well have been what was the role of a group like the, the medical committee or some other group? Yeah, I know the part from the um, case at New York Public Library, there was, it was originally a committee to provide assistance to the, um, to the, to, to, to the voter registration movement, and then some people developed the broader human rights agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and also, it seems to do with um, social deprivation and ill health, and how more or less the um, whole primary care system could be remodeled. So, yeah, so, so really those really who really have a, a much broader, mm -hmm. so they, uh, who had a, a much broader social agenda, right. and those who just wanted to provide assistance. So. Right. Well, that's what I was saying. I think my dad's thing of having people stay at the house and helping out with people was probably 
one of the original things the medical committee was trying to set up and do. Um, from one of the cases by research from John Thompson, is at the Bronx Psychiatric Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, John Thompson's library is still there. Oh, really? Was that set up by my dad when? Well, the, the story of the library is how I like um, is that um, when John died, he um, his, um, he had a lot of debts from his brother. Uh, there was a surgeon who uh, wanted to buy the book called um, Adipol. Mm -hmm. and um, but um, um, Milton Rosenbaum was very very keen that um, mm -hmm. should be, that the library should be um, put kept permanently, mm -hmm. um, and it was originally at I think Jacobi Hospital. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, I heard about it, and then. Um, traced it, someone got transferred to um, the Bronx Psychiatric Hospital. Mm. Um, and it is an incredible library, a lot of poetry, a lot of um, poetry. Mm. Like, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, um, philosophy, mm -hmm. um, books with dedications from authors, uh, I mean, the authors. Uh, prominent psychiatrists like Carl Jung. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, so it, and it's these are the books which John Thompson has collected since the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So they're more or less providing windows on his life. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was for, uh, yeah, a really interesting and mm -hmm. important book. And it's actually still there. That's great. Well, it might have well been transferred there when my dad was the uh, director of the hospital. Maybe Einstein said, we don't have room for this anymore, and the hospital offered whatever. Yes, it's with the postgraduate um, um, medical training. Uh, it's in the room that she's used that it's absolutely appropriate. She did that. It's great. Um, I think she did it. I think it's um, and they, um, yes, and I think there must have been, I mean, there's some things that John Dogman was very interested in, like dance therapy. Mm -hmm. I think the father was very interested in yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, um, maybe they collaborated on so. mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my dad was always, uh, he, I know he thought very highly of John Thompson, and um, he gave a lot of people their start or gave them room or space to do interesting things. He was very, my father himself was very innovative and um, was responsible for one of the first outpatient clinics, psychiatric clinics in the country. Um, and uh, the movement therapy, not dance therapy so much as overall movement therapy, um, there was a woman named Ermgard and I don't remember her last name, who developed that they used this Laban notation, uh, a way of choreographers use this to notate movement. And they would, um, my father would interview a family, let's say, that was having some problems, and there'd be a one-way mirror, and Ernard and her assistant, a woman named Martha Davis, in the house, would sit, they couldn't hear, they didn't want to hear any words, they just annotated the movement and then at the end they would meet with my father and say, the father in the group looked very angry or was doing, you know, and they would have very good description. That was the kind of thing that, you know, my father, uh, and you could see other people might say, oh, that's crazy stuff, I don't really need this. But my father was intrigued and gave a lot of people a chance like that. He knew them through the long run? Mm -hmm. They were, um, they were residents together, and uh, my father was on the original Einstein faculty when Bill Rosenbaum was the dean. So they knew each other lifelong. And uh, there was a whole crew of people who went to Einstein. Now, was John Thompson involved with the Einstein people? 
he was the assistant professor there. Uh, so he stayed for several years he was there? Yeah, he would have come in 58 mm -hmm. and uh, stayed for 65. Uh -huh. So a long time, I didn't realize. Yeah. Um, yeah he, he had been, after the war, he worked first of all for UNESCO, set up a, a, a program for um, he set, set up three medical institutes for education, mm -hmm. youth, and social science in Germany. And um, then he worked for a couple of years in Chalkai, running a Chalkai in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And his final, um, then um, Rosenbaum suggested that he should have to outside and join them. Great. Um, but he was a Seven years mm -hmm. um, well, there was a long-term crew of people, many of whom had been residents of Noel Rosendown in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then moved back. And um, uh, that group, that founders group, stayed together a long time, and it was very intense. I know there was a lot of uh, politicking in the sense of what direction should the medical school go and psychiatry department and so on. It was very intense, but I think a very productive time. And that was the first Jewish medical school, uh, you know, Jewish identified medical school in the country. And uh, I think the quality was uh, under Mill Road, and I think it achieved quite a bit of uh, you know, plaudits. I mean, the, um, I've met some of the um, people who trained there and who got to know John Thompson. So, um, Fred Sander, uh, who was mm -hmm. in the family therapy, mm -hmm. obviously. But I did a lot of family and community. Um, the community side is very interesting. Yeah, they were interested in, in social psychology, sometimes it was called then, then or social psychiatry, but community psychiatry, family psychiatry, that kind of outreach. And my uh, father became, I think it might have been 1968 or 67, I can't remember when he became director of the Bronx State Hospital, but that was an experimental program as well. That was a hospital that was having a lot of problems and they wanted to affiliate it with Einstein well, most of the state hospitals did not have any medical school affiliation. So it became a teaching hospital, yeah. and uh, my father unlocked most of the wards mm -hmm. and that kind of uh, stuff. But I think the plan was that it would be part of Einstein's uh, work, and um, I don't really know if that uh, was in the end considered successful or not. Um, I think, I mean, what I, I mean, I've seen a lot of, um, um, well, sort of writing about, you know, how a hospital really developed, and, mm -hmm. and um, people like the sort of the community, sort of community-based sort mm -hmm. of um, uh, units. And John Thompson, Tom Sebastian Littman, then worked on one of these. Uh, uh -huh. for, for the, uh, yeah. Um, so no, I think I mean I think the innovative sort of um, that sort of innovative uh, work really carried across then to mm -hmm. but it must have been very it must have been very conscious of the need to to have that sort of thing mm -hmm. yeah. 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 they were having trouble with the directors and finding the director yeah. 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 the quality of care was not very good yeah. 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 that must have been a big part of the process of yeah. yeah. the quality of care yeah. 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 You know, I think he then a lot of his time was being an administrator, but in the end, he, he when he left there, he became chairman of the department at Hahnemann in Philadelphia, and then dean of the medical school in Hahnemann. So he always took on a lot of administrative work. That was, I mean, he, but he all, he all, that was because he was interested in coming up the table. No, and they didn't. Um, uh, I think that was an earlier era than when they were interested in homeopathy. He, um, there was a period of time when he was considering 
whether they would offer him the position of dean when uh, Bill Rosenbaum left, I guess. Uh, and uh, when Einstein didn't, uh, not dean, but uh, chair of the department. I think I may, may I may be wrong. It may be that he was acting chair of the department, and then I think there was a time when he was acting chair of the department. But in any case, he, it didn't work out there in the end, and um, he had a lot of offers, and he. Uh, went to Philadelphia, and at Hahnemann, uh, he was very successful as the chair of the department. Um, they got, um, uh, it just changed dramatically. The same kind of thing, he brought in really excellent people, and students all over the country tried to come. It became their choice and the matching. They would get sometimes 100% of the matches that they wanted for residents. And, uh, but he, uh, after some years of that, um, he became dean of the medical school, and that was a lot of administrative work. Uh, and uh, my mother became, uh, was, uh, had a long illness. She was in a wheelchair and, um, in the hospital frequently, and it was hard for him to remain as dean uh, uh, and have the time to do the work, and, and eventually he uh, so sort of semi-retired, just saw patients and uh, uh, had uh, had an office that was given to him at some institute, I forget where, in Philadelphia. But um, that crew from Einstein was together for a long time and really made the place. Uh, so very, uh, I was fortunate to be Bill Rosenbaum. Mm -hmm. um, when did you meet him? Oh, it was in about 95 or 96, or something right. like that. And then he was done in Albuquerque. Right. And um, that was when I began to, to, to think quite a long time ago. Right. Yeah. Um, right. 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 I think he was, um, I mean, he, he said, well, he and Dr. Watson, they were like, they were very close, they were like two halves of one person, mm -hmm. but uh, he was very sort of grounded, and uh, John, I mean, uh, Milton, whereas John was very, mm -hmm. um, you know, he said about somewhere else, and mm -hmm. so on, and very sort of, yeah. uh, 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 much more on a uh, sort of visionary dream of her as Milton, just very, a very warm-hearted person. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he uh, um, he split his time between Albuquerque and Jerusalem, or Tel Aviv. He was, um, I think, administrative chairman of some department or something, um, and uh, he did that for a number of years. Uh, his uh, wife died um, when they were in Albuquerque during that period of the time. And I think there's still other people who may still be at Einstein. Huh? Kind of reti they've retired now, but they, they stayed through their whole careers. Yeah, I've tried. Well, I'm almost, as I said, I've talked to a few people. Uh, um, there, there are people trained on the job. Yeah. Um, on the, yes, um, the thing, there was a, a group of students, so um, I don't know, it was, they became, they moved in the direction of, um, RD9, mm -hmm. um, and, um, even arranged a meeting between Thompson and Lane, mm -hmm. um, but, I don't know what, did your thoughts look like RD9? Yeah. yeah. I mean, who, you, who, 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 who was involved in inspiring your father? Did he have any influences? Well, I don't know. He was uh, always interested in psychoanalysis. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I know he studied Freud and uh, uh, studied to become and became an analyst himself. So he always had that perspective on uh, things. But his true love was 
the community-based uh, practice, and the original models from that came from uh, the Soviet Union. That was stuff that they were doing after World War II that um, they were putting clinics in their cities or something. I don't know myself, but um, my father talked about that. And um, he admired Milt uh, Rosenbaum a great deal. Uh, but he, I think his, I think a lot of his energy fed off that, that group in Einstein. Because they felt in many ways they were pioneers. It was a, a new medical school and they could kind of give it the directions they wanted. So was the head of the uh, son Elton? That's, I know very much. Yeah, he was, uh, I think he was one of you also he supervised the collection of funds for the medical committee. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I think that's the, clearly, you know, it was a very exciting, mm -hmm. it was very sort of, it's a shame really that it didn't last for more than, yeah. it survived, it held together for about 10 years. That's right, yeah. And then, um, and that's the way of it. Kind of longer. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, that's. I mean, I am very interested um, to um, say because I feel it's very important to mention the community psychiatry. But also, I think the John Thompson Building mm -hmm. at the Bronx Psychiatric Hospital, which was dedicated, it must have been dedicated. It was dedicated two years after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was when my dad was, yeah. Yeah, my, my dad definitely, I remember him just commenting on what a wonderful man John was. And I know he, my dad really admired him. And what was the Freudian? He was, um, he was much more, he was actually very interested in um, in, for those who are too inarticulate to express mm -hmm. themselves verbally, so if you're a sort of new catatonic, mm -hmm. how do you provide right. um, your you, know, you can't do an analysis. Um, so um, he was very, very patient with the mm -hmm. um, sort of schizophrenic who were in that state, for example. Right. I think that's quite like with human movement therapy as well. Yeah. Well, I don't think, you know, I, I would imagine my father was open to quite a range of views. The fact that somebody wasn't a Freudian, I don't think, would have driven my dad away from him. Don't talk about Martin Buber, I guess. It's certainly very important to him. But again, um, the beyond the sort of the the field of rational. Right. Because this idea of dialogue is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, uh, he could not, I mean, he, he was a very, uh, um, dedicated Roman Catholic. He could not have been Do you know what, um, Catholic background was? No, I mean, any idea what I mean, did you go to America? Well, I I thought of him as a, a British, but I, I have no idea why I got that impression. Where was he from originally? Okay. Um, so he actually he was he was born in Germany, but he was born in Mexico, Mexico City, um, and his um, father had. Studied at uh, Stanford, and mm -hmm. I was uh, right, at, right at the time the university began, and there were Thompsons from the family. So mm -hmm. at one stage, when John Thompson's elder brother was kidnapped in Mexico, they were sent to Palo Alto to go to Palo Alto High School. Mm -hmm. So basically, John Thompson's schooling was a from out here. Yeah, had no yeah. idea. Um, he didn't really later on in life. He didn't. He he, he said well, what was important to him was um, when he went to medical school in Edinburgh. 
Mm-hmm. And then he nearly learned about human life and about patients. Mm-hmm. But also he was, uh, it was a good choice of school because the, um, the psychiatry was very open to, psych- to uh, psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. And uh, interestingly, I've, even, I've seen a lot of patient files of his and that's why they spent hours with his patients. This is in the 1930s, right? Yes. Uh-huh. Um, so that's what I think was somehow more formative. I think it was that the medical, the, the um, curriculum which he had as a pre medical student at um, uh, Stanford was very conventionally sort of mechanistic. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, a, you know, it, I think it was a high quality curriculum. I mean, you learned uh, all the techniques of physiology and neurosology and so on. But then spent the rest of his life moving away from them. Yeah. More interested in humans than ever doing animal experiments. Mm-hmm. You know, something very radically moved away from them. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then he came from Scotland, he came back to the United States at that time? Or? Oh, well, it's <laughs> you know, always in two places at once. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he was a student at Stanford, he took a course in Harvard. And when he was in Edinburgh, he started to his studies. And then, quite quickly, he was offered a post as instructor in biology at Swarthmore. He did that for a few years. Then goes back to Edinburgh. Via, he's been, um, in Germany, just at Freiburg, there's a very good pathologist called Ashoff, and he's at the Ashoff department. That he does is 33, so just on the mark, he's come to power. Mm-hmm. And then later on, he goes to Madrid to work with a, another ethologist called Karl. So now he was still very much interested in this, um, um, in doing his theological work at that time, but relating it to trying to find links to the emotions and um, Mm-hmm. And then in 37, 38, he gets a scholarship to go to Harvard and he joins a study on social adaptation. Mm-hmm. And he's a physiologist to this grant study, which is a, a lifelong study that they really have. And it's still going today. The mm-hmm. original same people are following you for a that's amazing. So that, yes, and he did that for a couple of years. Then he, and this is where the British guy begins to come in, his mother of the distant Scottish ancestry, who was really in Mexico for a number of generations, and he volunteered for the Canadian Air Force, the physiologist, work, doing interesting what is that experiment. So if they were to the um sort of experiments are actually very similar to what the um to some of the worst uh, Nazi experiments in presentation mm-hmm. now. But the problems were the, the same to do with low pressure. But um the um the Allied researchers were using much more self experiments and we're going to, took a higher, um, the pressure was actually rather lower than what the Germans would be using. Mm. And of course they would never, then there was an I mean, idea of forcing people to the point of death, which is what the Nazis were doing, which really shocked us off. So he did understand very well exactly what the Germans mm-hmm. were doing when he came. When he came with this, he was there from spur to the British Army. And, um, it's at that point in 45 where he's stationed very near Bergen Belton, the concentration mm-hmm. camp. And he begins to look after the survivors of Belton. Right. Well, he continued to do that work, right? Didn't he when he came back to Einstein? Yes. The Holocaust survivors. I, I know there's a lot of people who are involved in that in Einstein. You know about that? There was a provisional committee for victims of human disasters. Was there? I didn't know the formal. That was what it was called, which, and there was, um, they organized a number of meetings about the non-compensation for Holocaust survivors. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and it was just 1964 65, mm -hmm. it was just at the time of the um, human rights, I mean, yeah. civil rights. Right. Um, and um, I think the. Um, Someone who is, again, very significant, sort of, um, I mean, he makes an important contribution that um, mm -hmm. his last was a great statement that a number of meetings organized. And of course, the lobbying to get, because the German government has persistently refused to pay adequate compensation for these victims of human experiments. They're still not properly, I mean, there isn't, today, the compensation that a uh, uh, victim of uh, um, medical uh, of, um, medical properties is it's negligible. In a way, they're one of the most known groups of Holocaust victims. Mm -hmm. But um, the way that, that um, you know, you get a um, they got, you know, a lump sum is given, and so every and then mm -hmm. sort of calculated that everyone will get a proportion of this lump sum. Well, unfortunately, a number of mistakes were made when the slave labour compensation was mm -hmm. finally agreed a few years ago. One was that the um, only victims of human experiments would be compensated. Mm -hmm. So that if you were, say, your blood, I mean, the, the Marxists were draining liters of blood from people with the use of blood transfusion, and that's not an experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But any other form of medical abuse yeah. is excluded. And the other um, problem, well, two further problems are that the um, numbers of the victims of these experiments are really underestimated. Mm -hmm. So that um, it's just not enough funding. You just get a couple of thousand, a few thousand dollars. There was some mm -hmm. a few years ago. There was uh, someone who was compensated. Um, there was a long story about the New York Times, and he said, "Look, I received this compensation. Well, I was the victim of uh, X-ray sterilization. I've been in for the whole of my life." Uh, it was, uh, it was, there has been also um, um, the wounds and the pain have been very long term. And I'm offered such a low amount of them. It's an insult. And so that, you know, so that he sort of um, mm -hmm. gave his life history to the yeah. UK, so right. quite rightly. And there is also the compensation. There is no long term entitlement to medical care on the news spaces. Mm -hmm. So the whole, you would have thought that, I mean, the issues that were being looked at in you know, 64, 65 were issues that should have been resolved 10, 15 years before that, and now, third, and, and, and now they're 30 years on, it's it proven the last phase of human experiments were on children and adolescents. Mm -hmm. So there still are people who are alive today. Mm -hmm. So it's a group who will never be probably yeah. uh, never receive any I can say it, I mean you can't I can say a fair uh, I mean any sort of I mean uh, yeah, I think kind of what they what they really should have been given to 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 um, just, I think should have been would have been much better than had an agreement in terms of uh, long term medical care and the need basis. Mm -hmm. Also, all the Holocaust victims would take a health insurance. Yeah. Europe, yeah. The health insurance system. Right, now it's true. That's, that's been never ever done. So you think that, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a really sad situation. So yeah. the issues that j